JJ is a part of you as much as you are a part of you, and that's false because you are not a part of you as much as JJ is not a part of you. Because JJ's body and your body are both borrowed. They both don't belong to you. Both the bodies do not belong to you. You are a temporary resident of that room. So if you are a temporary resident of that room, why would you put so much energy into something that doesn't belong to you and you won't be able to keep because in the end, it'll just be discarded? So if it doesn't belong to you, why would you put so much energy towards it? And when, now you're getting this information on an intellectual level. If you think about it and meditate, every day you will disassociate. And when you disassociate, you will not abandon your body. You will not let it go. You will not neglect it. In fact, you will care for it more. Why? Because you realize that it's not something you own, it's a vehicle you can use to do better with. In fact, your body becomes a vehicle, not a property. So when you meditate on this correctly and well, what happens? Your body becomes a vehicle, not a property. Instead of having to own a car, you just ride a bus. You don't have to take care of the bus. Someone else will. So when we keep thinking, this is my body, I have to pleasure it. I'm stuck. I'm claustrophobic. I don't want to do this. I want to do that. I'm not happy. You said this to me. You did that to me. And you always think like that. You start implanting in your mind ownership of something you don't own and all the problems arise from that. You start creating ownership of something you don't own. You own your body as much as you own the person next to you. If you look at it in an ultimate sense, it's, it makes sense. So if you don't own the body next to you, left and right, in front of you, and behind you, that's why you're not so concerned about the next person. You also don't own your body. You have zero control of your body. Zero. Anytime your body can shut down on you and you're gone. Anytime. We may think, oh, but I'm young. I'm only 31, 32. No. Look at Justin in front of our eyes. A very beautiful person had to leave, had to pass away. No signs a week ago before his passing, no signs a month ago, no signs a year ago, no signs a day ago, no signs even one hour ago. No signs even one minute before. It wasn't like he was crawling and then he collapsed. He just collapsed. And then within two hours, our Dharma brother passed away in front of our eyes. which he proved to us that he did not own his body. And what happened to our Dharma brother will happen to all of us in one way or another. So if you don't own the bodies next to you, and therefore you don't have that much ownership or responsibility for or attachment, or you won't work as hard for it, you should apply the same principles to yourself that you also don't own your own body. And if we keep thinking, if we keep thinking we own our own body, if we keep thinking that, all of our sufferings, all of our disillusionments, all of our anger, all of our self-attachment, self-fears, insecurities, will keep coming up more and more and more. And you know what's horrible? The insecurities, the fears, the attachments, 
will increase with age. And even worse, with age, you can't fulfill all of your attachments. If you want to smoke 50 packs a day, you can't anymore because you're going to wheeze. It's not like when you're 20. If you want to go out and you want to have a relationship with every pretty girl, you can't. Your body can't take it anymore. If you want to go to disco all night and take drugs all night, you can't. You can't even stay awake class 12 anymore. If you want to go clubbing anymore, they're going to say, hey, Grandpa, what you doing here? Time to go home. Take a Geritol, go to sleep. So even if, and the sad thing is, as you get older, the attachments get stronger. They don't get less. Do you know why? If you can't break your habit of one year or two years, how can you break your habit of 30 years, 40 years? And in fact, our habituations, when we're older, we keep doing it, is what creates trouble in the family, in ourselves, and the people around us. So when we think about it very carefully, all this arises from holding the I, Da, very strongly. Me, I, that doesn't exist. And when we realize the I that's associated with this body doesn't exist, you know what happens? We start disassociating. Does it make us cold? No. In the interim, in between, pardo, in the interim, it makes us a little standoffish, a little confused, because we're trying to find our way. Because our whole life we've been holding on to this body, suddenly we realize it doesn't belong to us, I'll give you an example that's a little crude, but it's close. Suddenly you find out when you're 20, you're adopted. Oh my God, you mean you're not my parents? You mean you're not my cousin? You're not my mother? You're not my sister? You're not my aunt? And, they all, and everybody suddenly, suddenly over, over a, immediately looks like strangers, outsiders, something not connected to you anymore. Suddenly you find out you're adopted. Everything you believe is gone. Similarly, you will have a period of, an interim period of, you don't know what's going on. Confusion, a little standoffish, maybe some tears, maybe a little bit of movement. But then you'll come to terms and say, wait a minute. How many years have I wasted with this body? And in the end, it's exactly like the bodies next to me that I don't own. So what happens is that your body doesn't become a property. It becomes a vehicle. What's the difference when you view your body as a vehicle? Then you use it for the greater good of others. What's the difference when you see your body as property? Then you keep self-indulging. See the difference? If we keep, if we keep our body and keep thinking that it is property, we will continue to self-indulge until we cannot until we get bored, until we become lonely, or until we self-indulge so much that we sacrifice everything that had meaning for self-indulgence to the point of it has no more meaning anymore. There are people who sacrifice things with meaning for self-indulgence until the self-indulgence itself becomes a bore. And then loneliness, bitterness, unhappiness settles in. Why does it settle in? Because it's a natural way for a cognizing mind, a, percept, a perceiving, intelligent mind to say, what was that all about? And when the mind finds out that what we've been doing has no meaning, of course, you feel like you've wasted your time. If you spend millions and millions of dollars on something and no one uses it and there's no use, what will you feel? You're going to feel you wasted your money. Any normal person will be, who will say, oh, it's okay, the money will come, no problem, let's waste more. So any self-cognizing person with any sort of intelligence will feel, boy, whatever I've done with my body is such a waste. Such a waste. And that's how we'll feel. 
So when we think about it carefully, everything I'm telling you should not be used for criticism or pointing fingers or right or wrong, but it should be used as self-discovery. If we use it as self-discovery, you know what will happen? So our, we might be afraid, oh, when I start realizing this about my body, I might become cold and disassociate from my pets, from my partners, from my kids, from my parents, from my friends. Oh, on the contrary. On the contrary, when you disassociate yourself from property to vehicle, you have opened up the greatest vista to love, cherish, take care of everyone around you with no agenda. You start to love with no agenda. Why? Because you it's a vehicle now. It's not an ownership. Does everybody understand? How do we create effortless love? How do we create love without agenda? How how can we create the attitude of bending ourselves backwards for others effortlessly, tirelessly, continuously? How? By viewing our body as a vehicle. A vehicle to a greater end. A vehicle to something better. A vehicle to something higher. When we view our body as ownership, depression, unhappiness, selfishness, all that becomes reinforced. There's a difference when you view your body as ownership or vehicle. Ownership means you own it, you take care of it, you focus all your energy on me, 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 me. Because I own it. Me, mine, me. So that me, 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 me gets reinforced. Whereas when you see your body as ownership, when you see it as ownership, all the unhappinesses will increase with time. Because everything you'd like to do, you can't do anymore. But the attachment will still be there. The body will become your traitor. But whereas if you see your body as a vehicle, you won't overindulge. You won't self-indulge. Why? Why work so hard for something you don't earn, you don't own? So therefore, if you see your body as a vehicle, vehicle means to take you from point A to B. From point A, me, to B, others, happiness, growth. So by meditating on these precious teachings, by meditating on these precious teachings, what happens? Our bad habits become easier to let go of. Our feeling of restlessness to go do something becomes less. Doing work for others becomes pleasurable. And as you age, you become gracious, light, inspiration, a guy, beautiful, mature, look up to, and a person people fold their hands and go, that's a wonderful person, as you age. As opposed to when you treat your body as something you own, as you age, oh, still like that up. So old, still like that up. So old, still think like that up. Yes. So today's explanation is not about becoming a colder, uncaring, irresponsible person. In fact, you become the opposite. Examples of people who are selfless. Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, maybe even Aung San Suu Kyi. Instead of becoming bitter and unhappy and lonely and abandoned, the minute we hear Nelson, hear Nelson Mandela is not well, we all light some incense to hope he gets well very quick. I'm concerned when he was ill recently. The whole world is concerned because this person cared about the whole world. So the whole world will care back. Now what about the other hundreds of thousands of people in South Africa who are still ill that we know nothing about? Well, with respect to them, they cared about no one, I think, so no one cares about them. 
And that's how we need to think. So when we disassociate our mind from our body, we don't become colder. We don't become cruel, uncaring, or narrow. In fact, we open the doorways to become bigger. All our fears and insecurities will go down. Why? Fear and insecurity can only hide in the dark and exist in the dark. Where there is light, they cannot exist. Darkness is selfishness. Light is giving and love and care for others. So where there is light, there cannot be darkness. Where there is no darkness, the, the, the things that abide or live in the dark must die, must exit, must go away. Selfishness live in the dark. And darkness is me. And when we let go of that, we live in the light. When we live in the light, insecurity, all that goes away. Why does it go away? Because where there is light, insecurity and fear and selfishness cannot live. And when we do this kind of meditation every single day, at the time of death, we don't need a Lama to do poa for us. Consciousness transference. We can do poa ourselves. We can think about Lama Tsongkhapa. We can think about Manjushri. We can think about Vajrakini. We can think about our gurus. Anything that reminds us of virtuous activity. Anything. We can think about the Lajang. We can think about Gaden. We can think about a Tsoksha. We can think about monks. We can think about nuns. Anything that relates to our virtuous activities as we're dying, when we focus, we think about this. It will open up the good karma that we have accumulated. And from here, our consciousness, Sheba, will leave. And when our consciousness leaves from here, we take a very good rebirth. And when we take good rebirth, where we have left off in this life's journey, we continue. So if we left off at four, next life we continue at five. Whereas normal people leave off at one, they return back to one. Then they die, they would die again at one, they go start again at one. Then they die again, and some start off at zero. Because they can take a lower rebirth. Now do lower rebirths, such as spirits and ghosts, exist? Do they exist, Vinny? Well, if lower existence such as ghosts and spirits exist, why can't we go there? Why can't we die and reincarnate as them? And when we, when our body actually, physically, comically starts to disassociate with our mind that's called death, then whatever we have done will catch up. All the good stuff will catch up, all the bad stuff will catch up. Good and bad is deciphered, or, or yes, deciphered by me and them. All the activities you did for them is good. All the activities you did for me reinforces the me. So next life you start at one again. So this good and bad is not like a Christian Judeo sense of punishment, hell or heaven. It's more of a reaffirmation of the self, selfish mind that you come back living that selfish life again and again and again and again and again. And in one blunt, clear, simple sentence, selfishness hurts. It hurts us and it hurts others. Selfishness hurts. Who in this room have experienced the pain of other people's selfishness? Please raise your hand. Okay. Who in this room has given pain to others due to our own selfishness. <laughs> Me too. Was giving selfishness pleasant? Now that we retrospect back, not really. Was getting the pain of someone's selfishness, the result of selfishness, did it feel good to you? No. So selfishness, we can see logically, is not good. We just decided. The council here decided. So. What have we decided? Is selfishness a pleasurable feeling or displeasurable? Okay. 
if selfishness is displeasurable, not pleasurable, then the causes of selfishness is positive or negative. If the causes of selfishness is negative, then we must remove the causes, correct? If we remove the causes, we don't create the pain. That's it, the council has decided. We didn't need the Buddha to come here and tell us. We didn't need Trijayaram Chi to come and tell us. We didn't need Benham Humble to come and tell us. We used our own intelligent human minds to say, hey, I've experienced other people who were very selfish, thought about themselves, and did, they didn't care about me. They didn't care about the repercussions of their actions. They didn't care about how they hurt us. They didn't care about how they disappointed us. And it hurts. It hurts. Wow, I felt that. And then when I retrospected back of some of the things I did, I myself did, and it really hurt people when I found out, I feel I'm embarrassed. It's hard to look at that person in the face. So the selfishness I've given to people hurts them and me. The selfishness they've given to me hurts me and them. So therefore, the council here can conclude selfishness is Negative. How logical Buddhism is. How logical it all is. This is what Lama Tsongkhapa has been talking about in the Lamrim. This is what Lama Tsongkhapa, this is what Shanti Deva keeps talking about in, in the Bodhisattva Charavatara. This is what Shandara Sita keeps talking about in The Wheel of Sharp Weapons. This is what all these masters are talking about. And here, you know what? Most of us in this room haven't read the works of these masters, but we have decided that selfishness is not good and it's painful. And that's the logic of it. So the next time we are in, in a state of confusion, disarray, don't know what to do, sit back and meditate. Find refuge in yourself. Find refuge in your truth. Find refuge in your contemplation. Find refuge in your knowledge. The knowledge I give you now, when obstacles arise, don't let it become intellectual. Say, I know that, but I can't do it. Then you deserve all the pain you're going to get. You deserve all the pain you're going to get. It's like people who say, hey, I'm going to traffic drugs in Malaysia. And then they get to jail. And then their parents are upset, their friends are upset, their girlfriend's upset, their boyfriend's upset, and they're crying, they're begging the judge. But look, you knew. You knew. You were told. And you said, never mind. So when you're in jail on death row, why should anybody fight for you? Why should you be sad or scared? You knew. So therefore, it's very important 